Okay, so let's move on to our, um, our session of model tribal programs. Um, we're gonna begin today um, with the Oklahoma State University Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity Panel, moderated by Dr. Valerie Blue Bird Jernigan, who is the Professor of Medicine and Rural Health and Director of the Oklahoma State University Center for Indigenous Health Research and Policy, and uh, the panelists will also introduce themselves. Thank you, everyone. Is that not him? No. Uh -uh. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Oh, great. Is your name coming? I hope everybody had a wonderful uh, evening last night. It was such a beautiful day yesterday. I just got so many amazing gifts and lessons from the speakers and the networking and just being in community together. So I'm, as, you, as always, so grateful to be here. And what a beautiful prayer this morning. Thank, thank you, Hope. So nice to be here and see all my friends and relatives and kinfolk and just love, love this place so much and love you guys. So we're going to talk about the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. And we're kind of excited to talk about this. We're not super polished on this. It's sort of a story, an ongoing story that we're experiencing together. And so um, we're going to talk kind of just talk about it a little informally. But we do have some slides that we're going to show you. So Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity is what is supporting these projects that our folks are gonna share about and also this conference um, in part with Mindy and the other sponsors. Um, the genealogy of CIHI is one that is truly grounded in community-based, community-initiated work. And it started as a cross-cultural learning exchange between Osage Nation, Choctaw Nation, friends and relatives in Hawaii, and their relatives in Aotearoa. And we all gathered in, I think it was 2019, and we talked about how we could use a food sovereignty approach to create healing and wellness. And from that, our, we said our heart maps overlapped their heart maps. And we went back to our respective communities and we developed this collaboration. And we didn't really understand or know yet what it was gonna look like. There were just a few things that we wanted to do. First, um, we wanted, to, we wanted to have this project be all about co-learning. So there wasn't any kind of top-down approach. It was all us learning from each other. We um, also wanted it to identify and spotlight and uplift community-based initiatives that focused on food sovereignty, however that was defined or imagined in different contexts. And I have to emphasize that this happened probably mostly because of this initiative, this gathering together, but also because at that point, many of us had been doing clinical trial public health intervention science for 20 years. We knew how to get large grants, but we didn't want to get a large grant and then have a bunch of structure to tell communities what to do. We wanted to get a large grant and then give the funds out with no sort of dick, I guess, like no direction. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, um, and see what happened. And we also wanted to explore mostly what, is, what are indigenous methodologies. We say that a lot, but what does it actually look like? What does it mean? 
And we wanted to learn what that would look like if we just started to do it. And as an interventionist, as an indigenous woman, I'm a pragmatist. So I learn by doing. I don't do a lot of, I feel like I don't do a lot of theory. I just do it and I learn from it and then I go and I do it again and I learn more. And so um, I have learned so much from these folks on stage and the journey continues. So I'm gonna um, give the mic over to our first slides are from South Central Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska. We have our friends Kyle, Kyle Wark and Ryan Mortensen, and they're going to talk, and then we'll go in the same direction. So I think, Ryan, you're up. Well, good morning. Thank you all for being here. My name is Ryan Mortensen. I'm Yupik from uh, Southwest Alaska, and my Yupik name is Junyokuk. Um, here with me is Kyle Wark. He's Clinkit, Alaska Native, and we also have John here at the conference who specializes in food security. Uh, we're researchers and program evaluators from South Central Foundation. We wanted to share with you the landscape analysis and the SCF Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity. South Central Foundation also referred to as SCF is a tribal health organization located in Anchorage, Alaska, provides services to approximately 65,000 people and serves 55 villages in the South Central Alaska, uh, shown in the figure outlined in red. SCF joined the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity with the goal of identifying, implementing, and evaluating food sovereignty initiatives with the greatest priority to the Alaska Native American Indian communities it serves. We used a community-based participatory research approach to identify and prioritize food sovereignty interventions to strengthen the transmission of cultural knowledge across generations and improve Alaska Native and American Indian health. SCF assembled a CEHE team comprised of four staff with three Alaska Native researchers and an evaluation specialist. Once the SCF CEHE team was assembled, the first step the the team did was to conduct a comprehensive landscape analysis of existing food sovereignty programs within SCF as well as the broader community of South Central Alaska. This process allowed SCF to identify and catalog the various ways food sovereignty was being implemented in areas where support was needed to uplift and strengthen these efforts. The landscape analysis consisted of meetings with several groups and organizations within and external to SCF where we asked each group how they defined and implemented food sovereignty, and, that, and then asked them to identify areas of the greatest priority regarding supporting food sovereignty efforts within their community. The SCF team met with the Elders Program, Health Education, Traditional Healing, and Dietitians. And outside SCF, the team met with the Community Health Department of the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, an allied tribal health org with two researchers who work outside of the tribal health system. The outcome of doing the landscape analysis meetings resulted in having a focus on supplying elders with traditional foods, the recognition of the importance of traditional foods to healthy diets, and the role gardening can play in supplying healthy foods and promoting physical activity even in Alaska, a stress on using conferences to share information about traditional foods, and how multimedia, especially video recordings, can be leveraged to promote the sharing of information about traditional foods. Findings from the landscape analysis informed the development of a food sovereignty focused community advisory board made up of primarily of tribal health leaders and an elder, mostly individuals who participated in the landscape analysis and expressed interest in being part of a larger community and regional effort to promote food sovereignty. Guided by the principles of indigenous community based participatory research, the CAB reviewed the findings from the landscape analysis with SEF staff and determined that a comprehensive initiative was needed that highlighted and showcased various food sovereignty efforts. The CAB prioritized the planning and implementing of a conference style gathering highlighting regional efforts to document, revitalize, and share cultural food knowledge and practices while connecting those efforts to health and wellness. These efforts aim to support the transmission of knowledge across generations and an indigenous and decolonized view of food and health. From the direction of the CAB, the SCFC he team implemented a two-day traditional foods gathering on August 28th and 29th. We had three breakout workshops happening simultaneously. 
With each workshop, we had about 50 to 70 participants in attendance. Some of the workshops included dietitians exploring research regarding the health benefits of traditional food and lifestyles and highlighting specific nutrients provided by traditional foods. The essay of traditional healing folks hosted how to make devil's club salve and learn about other ways to use the devil's club plant. And we had Heidi Rader with the Alaska Food Policy Council share information resources in creating about creating a healthier, more secure, more self-reliant Alaska by improving Alaska's food system. We had Chef Amy with Nana Management Services. Nana Management is a uh, tribal regional corporation in Alaska, and they discussed some of their other efforts, and they also cater for the tra uh, traditional foods gathering. Some of the foods included salmon belly soup with Alaska bull kelp, birch glazed wild Alaskan salmon with homemade fry bread, and wild berry jam. The CHE SCF initiative highlights the work of a truly community-driven initiative to promote wellness within the tribal health system and beyond. The landscape analysis uncovered various ways food sovereignty initiatives were implemented within SCF and community settings. CAB members were instrumental in this initiative, leading efforts to identify and select an intervention topic, set the agenda, nominate speakers, and draft invite lists. The CHE SCF gathering helped the indigenous community celebrate all the ways our peoples have built relationship, uh, relationships with the plants, animals, the land, sea, and sky. Hoyana Jakna, thank you very much. Halito and Chachikma. My name is Jacqueline Putman. I'm from the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Um, we're very honored to be here, very honored to be involved in such a, a spectacular thing as trying to re, re, uh, rededicate our foods and our ways to our, our, from our ancestors to our futures. Um, in the Choctaw Nation, the women own the homes, own the land, and do the gardening. And it's not because we are, are it's a women's work, it's because we're givers of life. So the women are over the gardens, and we've been doing gardening for thousands of years. We took tanzanite, that was a weed, and, and made it into corn, what we call maize today, what we call tanchi. Um, what we do with the Grow and Hope program for Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma, what we do is grow out the heirloom seeds that came down the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears was when uh, our ancestors left Mississippi. They would sow the, hems, the, sow the seeds in the hems of their dresses and their garments to make sure the soldiers didn't take the seeds because we knew once we got to Oklahoma where we were going, we had to have food and start over. And they wanted to keep us starved out, but our ancestors knew they were thinking ahead for us, and I'm so thankful they did. So what we have, we have the Choctaw sweet potato squash. This you'll see up there, it's a beautiful, looks like a pumpkin, but it's not. This is high in manganese, magnesium, zinc, vitamin A, and iron. It'll last up to a year on a shelf in a cool, dry spot. It can be made anything you use a winter squash for, you can use this for. It's fantastic. It is amazing. You can dry it, you can make jerky, you can make uh, peel and fruit, you can do anything with it. Our Tanchi flower corn can grow up to 20 feet tall. We can grow up to 15 inch ears. These things are what we would grow in Three Sisters Gardening. And then we would have our uh, Smith peas or, or Chuck V peas, which would be rabbit. They're just small peas which complement one another. They all grow very well together. They complement one another. Um, what we do is we hand out our seeds to our tribal members. Uh, we grow out heritage plants and we, we hand them out to our tribal members. What we do is distribute the foods and the produce. We give them to the community centers and so forth. We're working on getting community gardens for all of our elders and their community centers. Um, what we're doing now, we have actually sent seeds to Boeing. Um, November 1st, at the beginning of Native American Heritage Month, the Choctaw Nation will have seeds, our traditional seeds, going up on the space shuttle NASA that will orbit and come back down in the next few months and will be taken to our uh, Native school, our Choctaw Native school, for our students to grow out and do a STEM search on, so, on, on their program. So we're very excited about that. Um, Choctaw Nation is a great, great uh, tribe. We're very thankful for our tribe. They look out for our people and our elders. We're about faith, family, and culture. We're a Christian nation. Um, we do honor our traditional ways as well. When we repatriate our ancestors back, we do our all traditional ways, but we also do a Christian way as well. But what, what we do here is we hand out our seeds. Um, these are seeds that actually came down the Trail of Tears. These seeds, some of them were brought down on the Trail of Tears in 1830 with Dr. Ian Thompson's family. So we try to ensue the integrity of all of our seed, everything to, to hand out. And anyone that wants seed, I'm not going to tell them no. I don't care if you're native or if you're not. I don't want anyone hungry. 
We didn't tell the Irish no, and I'm not going to tell anyone else no either. I want us all to survive. I want us all to make it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Harley Moore, and I am the Food Sovereignty Coordinator of the Osage Nation. The Osage Nation was very pleased to be a part of this project. We want to improve food security and food sovereignty. And the Osage Nation utilized CARES funding to build a 40,000 square foot state-of-the-art greenhouse, a 19,000 um, foot state and USDA inspected butcher house. So with this funding opportunity, we created a mobile market. So this mobile market allows us to go out into our community um, to be able to provide fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, and fresh meat to our community members, to our elders. Um, as you see in this slide, uh, we have a trailer. And so this trailer is outfitted um, with freezers and refrigerators. And we go into the communities because our communities are very small. Um, on average, most communities have about 300 people. And Osage Nation Reservation is the size of Osage County. Osage County is um, bigger than the state of Rhode Island. And so we have three grocery stores, um, two are local, locally owned grocery stores that are at the end of the food chain when you are trying to get fresh produce within those grocery stores. And then we have a Walmart, not a Walmart supermarket, not a Walmart grocery store. We have plain old Walmart that has pretty low quality produce also. And so at this point, we had saw that majority of our community members, our tribal members, they have forgotten how to store fresh fruits and vegetables. They've forgotten how to cook fresh fruits and vegetables. And so with that, we have started canning a lot of our produce that we have and offering those at mobile markets also. And so we are canning homemade spaghetti sauce, homemade stew tomatoes. Um, we do lots of jams and jellies that have a lot less additives than you would in the grocery store. And we are seeing a very positive impact with, with those canned goods. We are providing fresh vegetables and fresh meat and fresh um, fruit at these mobile markets too. But the biggest sellers are, are these canned goods because that is what our community knows how to utilize at this point in time. Um, we, are, we are trying to push the fresh initiative. But it's okay because they are getting a better product at the end um, with, with less sugar added, less salt added. You can see in this picture, um, there's our spaghetti sauce. We do a homemade ketchup and a tomato bisque. Uh, then there's a few um, jellies in the top right. We also have fresh eggs. And so we have uh, 30 chickens that lay about 30 eggs a day. And we provide fresh eggs to our community. And we donate these um, excess eggs to our elder nutrition programs so that we are not uh, wasting any eggs at this point in time. And we are able to provide to our community and, and especially our elders. And then we, we try to have a variety of squash at all points of time because squash was a traditional plant for us. Um, and almost everyone still knows how to cook and utilize fresh squash at this point in time. And I just really want to thank uh, Miss Valerie and Oklahoma State for including us in this project. Thank you. Adeo uh, Chuds. That means hello, everyone. Haleg Ezra. My name is Haleg, or Laverne Dementev. Degetanitlan, Deloitte Chet Histant, Fairbanks Disto. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. This is my, my first conference, um, and it has been amazing. It's so amazing. Um, I'm so grateful, Hashirka Distin. I'm so, so grateful uh, to do this work. And um, I wanted to share this, uh, this project with you that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and we're so grateful to Sihi um, and the Office of Minority Health uh, and our our partner organization, Danakanaga. And you can probably see up there, I wanted to introduce a couple of elders that I work really closely with. Um, Elizabeth Flegel, who's sitting down, she is uh, my mentor. And she has um, this beautiful way of, um, as you can tell, just compassion, right? Exudes from her compassion and joy. 
and I co-teach with her uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where I'm a professor of social work. Um, we've got the, 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 we would just been so blessed to be uh, working alongside her. Um, and the other woman is Anna Frank, and she is um, probably the, the one that, when we were initially doing um, talks with the elders at Danakanaga, which is the elders organization in, in the interior of Alaska, she said, um, we would like to see an elders mentoring elders uh, program or a uh, camp uh, where elders can learn from each other about how to step into their role as elders, young, so old, older, more experienced elders uh, mentoring and supporting younger elders. And these two women uh, are both honorary doctorates through the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, they're they're uh, well known across Alaska and highly respected. Just want to give them honor and um, and gratitude for for um, guiding us in this work. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Laverne Dementeff, and I'm a, 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 um, a one of the researchers along with Jessica Black. Uh, I'm Degaton Athabaskan. The Degaton people are from Southwest Alaska on the Yukon River, um, and Jessica is Gwich'in and um, she wasn't able to be here today, but she sends her, her regards and her love. Um, we, as I mentioned, have been partnering with uh, Danakanaga, which is a nonprofit organization that serves as the voice of Native elders of Interior Alaska. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, you know, when we first started this work, uh, we really, we just asked if we could um, talk with the elders about what they felt was important in the interior. And as I mentioned, um, the elders started talking about uh, the boarding school era and traumas and how they really, really wanted uh, to support younger um, elders, up and coming elders, emerging elders to step into their roles, uh, recognizing that it can be uh, a very um, it includes a lot of grief. We've had these conversations yesterday. Um, it was it was so important to hear um, from so many of the presenters uh, about um, the level of grief uh, that people are still experiencing um, and the shame sometimes of not um, having learned your language or a learned a practice in in your community, um, traditional knowledge, um, and that. Uh, is really painful. I think it has been um, something that we have not really uh, explored a lot of, recognizing that um, you know we we are um, recognizing the need to support elders as they're as they're um, stepping into that role. And so the elders in their wisdom were just you know, we really want to see an elders camp, uh, and so we were able to really just listen to their words and think about how we can uplift um, their ideas in this work. And um, so we, we created an elders camp that, um, here is uh, a couple of the elders and Jessica and myself. Uh, we created an elders camp that really was focused around um, healing, and non-judgment, coming into a safe space, uh, and being able to learn uh, and talk about skills and remember. Um, and it's, it was such a beautiful experience. Uh, we've, we have, we had so many things going on. Um, we we're smoking uh, moose hide, cutting fish, um, uh, tufting, uh, so beading and tufting with caribou hair. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting and important was that the elders were saying, we really want to see um, and have a values discussion throughout the whole camp. Um, one of the elders specifically said, we have posters, our values posters, that are all over the walls in schools and different places, um, Danae Athabaskan values posters. And she said, but you know, we have to talk about these values and how we're practicing them and putting them into um, existence. And so, you know, we've really, uh, we really um, uh, just listened and we, we 
um, created that space for talking about values. Um, and it was probably, that was, um, the camp has been going on for the past two years, and that's been a highlight. Um, people telling stories, talking about our values, and how we live our values today. So that was one thing that was, that really came from this camp. I think that, you know, um, when we initially uh, talked with Valerie about funding, uh, we were um, wondering, we were talking about how this particular project fit into a nutrition program. And one of the things that we highlighted was this, re this aspect of relationality, right, and relationship uh, to, the, to, the, to the world around us and how through um, colonization and boarding schools, um, sometimes that relationship um, uh, uh, has just been either severed or uh, we've struggled um, to maintain that in our kind of fast-paced modern society. And that part of this camp was just to begin to reconnect with that relationship, really just support each other in a non-judgmental space where we can say and acknowledge you know, that maybe we haven't learned something and work on it and practice it together. I think uh, it's partly uh, building a community of care and practice. So, um, you know, we were guided by, uh, this is another elder too, um, and this was la not this past year, but the last year, uh, where we were, the elders were showing how to fillet uh, salmons and salmon to hang them. And there was some people um, that had said that they had not cut fish before, um, or they had not cut fish since they were little. And, and then they got to take the fish home. But um, that was really powerful uh, for people to be able to express that um, and to find joy in that process together as a community, uh, learning together, growing together, healing together um, in, this, in this project. So our core beliefs um, are that, uh, you know, Alaska Native cultural practices must continue to exist for another 10,000 plus years. And I think about all of our ancestors um, who, and, and our elders that have, you know, uh, endured so much um, to make sure that in today's society, uh, we can, I have a, um, an elder, Jim Dementi, who was my language mentor. Um, and I think about his experiences and what he did to keep the language. Uh, in our area, we have probably uh, five fluent speakers left. And I think of him uh, and our language is Daikhanog, um, and uh, we are Diné, uh, part of the Diné family. Um, and you know, I think about him and his efforts to keep the language, protect it during some really difficult times. And throughout his whole life, he died a few years ago. He was 94, I think. Um, and, and his effort over that time to, to uh, teach it and give it back. And that is so powerful to me. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And uh, so now my responsibility is to help continue that, to continue that work. Um, and I think that's, that's something we can do. That's something in our culture. Uh, when we learn something, we give it back. When we learn something, we share it out. Um, and that's how we continue to go. So uh, our other, another core belief is that cultural practices serve as a guide for wellness and healing in our communities and organizations and systems. There's so many, um, and I just keep hearing this over and over at the conference, and it's so beautiful um, to be here and just to, to uh, to hear all of that, um, in you know, in our healthcare system uh, today, so much of it is external to who we are. Right? We go seek out services outside of our communities, outside of ourselves, doctors, uh, dentists, where, wherever. Right? So we just go. We often go outside, and we have cultural practices, uh, as we've heard, and medicine within our community um, that. Uh, are so powerful, um, and uh, many of the traditional practices are built around context and our values uh, and our way of life, and they're built into everyday life, so it's not external to us. It's built into our communities and how we think and how we, how we um, uh, live in a good way, and that's, um, I think, just continuing to promote that is so important. Uh, Alaska Native people and communities have the strength, resilience, and capacity to confront the challenges they're faced with. I, um, 
you know, I think that the more, I mean, again, we heard this yesterday, right? We have within our communities and in our, um, and in nature, the, the capacity to, to confront the challenges that we're faced with within our traditional practices and our ceremonies. That's what they were created for. Um, and then the last one is that Alaska Native communities should be at the helm of all research, programming, and activities that involve them. Uh, as, you know, one of the things that I've been really proud of um, in this project has been that, you know, both Jessica and I are Dene. Uh, we are two Athabascan, Degaton, uh, um, and Gwich'in women um, doing this work alongside elders in our community. Uh, and that um, grounded in that relational lens, uh, we grew up with these elders. Um, you know, we have multiple, multiple relationships with these elders in our community, from whether they're family, uh, we're connected to them, uh, just in the work that we're doing, and just seeing them and being around them. Um, and that's a different level, um, I think, of research that happens when people from the community are involved in that way. It's, um, it's very powerful. Uh, we definitely, you know, our focus was to uplift. How do we uplift the voice of the elders and what they want? Um, and that uh, I feel we have done really well, um, just listening and saying, let's let's just let's do it, you know, and having them guide us every step of the way. So we did two culture camps. This one passed uh, in past July, and then last year was in June. Um, and we're going to have a another uh, sharing circle in a couple of weeks where we'll ask the elders, where should we go from here? We've done these two years. Um, we really are um, wanting your guidance again to see where do we want to continue this? Do we want to expand this? Um, and just to, to continue to have that guidance. Um, let's see. I, I also wanted to say, you know, part of the, the process was um, being together on the land. Uh, we went to Howard Luke's camp. Um, you can see um, part of it, part of the, we had some dancing and drumming uh, at the camp. Um, Howard Luke's is a place, a uh, pretty sacred space um, where many people go to, to gather and, and heal and grow. Um, as I mentioned, we had the values discussion, which was uh, essential. And what I've learned is that from the elders is that um, as we go forward, uh, talking about our values, uh, about stories, about how to live in a good way was super important. Um, healing in the community, um, healing in this process is necessary. Um, there was so, so many people just so grateful to be able to uh, try something that they haven't tried. And you know, one of the amazing things that happened is as people would come, they would say, you know, kind of um, nervously or fearfully, like, I've never done this before. Um, but then they would say, but you know, my grandma or my auntie, or I remember when I was a kid, this would happen. And they would start sharing, and then they would share and share. And, um, and then I, I just, it was so empowering to remember. Um, people would remember uh, what they knew and share that out. And that was the process, I think, recognizing that even through all of the loss, people, we held on to so much, and people were remembering and sharing that. It was really powerful. Um, I think that, that creating that safety to be our whole selves was super important uh, in this space where there was still a lot of, you know, gr there's still a lot of grief and um, shame. Uh, and then we, we ended with talking circles and sharing circles. And just one example, um, you know, that first year we had a talking circle and we went around and it was led by an elder. It was very powerful. And this year, um, we, it, was a, it was a really long day. We had done so much that day. Um, and we came into this space of closing. Uh, well, that week, it was a long week. And we came into this space of closing. And... Um, one of the, the, um, one of the elders said, you know, uh, well, we, we also wanted to video record. So we asked the question, is this, is this going to be okay? Should we do this? Should we not do this? 
and one of the elders said, you know, a talking circle shouldn't be video recorded, um, and that wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to be and express what we need to express with that, um, with that there. And the second chief came and he spoke and he said, I would really like um, if, we, if we did do a, a circle, whether it was, maybe we could, we're not calling it a talking circle, but we're calling it a sharing circle because uh, we feel it's important for funders um, and for others to hear what we're doing. Uh, so everyone agreed that that was acceptable um, to call it a sharing circle. And I think that level of fluidity was super important. Um, to be able to make those decisions with the people and with the group. Um, I won't get into too much. We're, we have initial findings, really, just that um, there was that confidence and empowerment uh, once people started doing uh, the activities. Um, and uh, that was really beautiful. Uh, to see. So a lot of the emerging elders were able to remember a lot of their teachings throughout the camp um, and, and, and were able to share out. So that was the other goal, that the camp um, promote these activities, people were learning, uh, and so many people were excited to actually go home and share it with their families and communities. Um, we, you know, just again, grounding participants in Athabascan values and discussions was essential. Um, and then the, the camp promoted healing, connection, and hope. So um, there was a lot of discussion about what was, uh, what was lost, but that this felt so good to be, to be coming together and learning in a safe space. Um, there's a couple of quotes here, but you know, one, today, I, today was the first day I got to cut fish. Uh, I appreciated learning all of this stuff because I want to hand it down to my kids and grandkids. We have that natural inclination to want to do that. Um, and so to be able, for people to be able to learn something and share that with their grandkids was, was really powerful. Um, you know, there were some participants that shared they hadn't had uh, any, they haven't uh, participated in something for 35 years. And he said they're getting back into it. Um, they're going to share it with their grandchildren that live outside of Alaska. So, so many, so many amazing comments. Um, here, uh, uh, one of the younger uh, elders is learning how to make a fishnet. Um, and so the elder Elizabeth Fleagle is teaching uh, this skill about how to make a fishnet and how she used to do that when she was little in the winter. And they would just sew on the fishnet all winter. And you think like, oh my gosh, if anything were to happen and you needed to get food, like what an amazing skill to have. And it's super fun. It's actually really easy once you get into it. Um, and then you, ha you can make a fishnet, your own fishnet. So, Dokudin, uh, Masi, for, uh, for listening. I'm so grateful again to be here. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Valerie. We have about 10 minutes left, and I'm very curious if the audience has questions, but um, we haven't heard, I'm putting you on the spot, <laughs> we haven't heard from our partner, Kyle. And I guess I also, I'll direct this question to, um, to Kyle. Um, I really love that Laverne kind of, you know, I think one of the things we learn in, in medical school and in public health school is that we remove ourselves from the process. We, we are objective and we're not part of what we're observing. Um, and we know, as Dr. Redver said yesterday, that we are an integral part of all of this. And that is what I think makes native science so different from Western science, one of the many things. And I guess um, one of the questions that I had um, was kind of what, what we've learned about it. And maybe I'll direct Kyle, uh, that question to Kyle, you know, um, what did you kind of learn from this experience over these last couple of years? <clears throat> 
Yeah, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, you, you haven't heard the last one me. I have a presentation tomorrow. We'll also be talking about indigenous research and how it applies to the project that we did here for CIHI. Um, I think part of what uh, resonated with me for the project was the open-endedness of it, was the uh, allowance to have the community direct the project and give space for the length of time that's necessary to truly engage the community. So we, when Ryan talked about assembling the CAB, the community advisory board, um, they, they are the ones who selected the intervention of hosting a conference. They're the ones who selected the topics that would be covered in the conference. They nominated the speakers who would be speaking to those topics. They helped us draft the invite list and had input in the evaluation that we used to assess were we successful in hosting that conference? Did we learn what we needed to from it? Uh, and I think that's really amazing. Um, it was also the first time that our department, the SEF Research Department, ever hosted a large event, and I was in charge of it, and it gave me a deep appreciation for how much is involved in assembling a large meeting like this. So again, hats off to all of you who were part of the planning committee. Um, it was a deeply uh, steep learning curve, <laughs> and there was a large number of things that I never considered before that needed to be finalized. Um, it, it was uh, definitely an exercise in indigenous research methodologies. It was intergenerational, it was holistic, it was grounded in our values as Native people. It made space for the broad diversity of um, operations that go on within tribal health systems as well as outside of tribal health systems. It allowed people from all across Alaska to speak and present uh, on their particular uh, context and settings. Alaska is about a fifth the size of the United States, I think. Uh, SCF, our, our organization, serves uh, 55 villages across 108,000 square miles. It's a, bit, a little bit less than half the size of Texas. Um, yeah, something like that. Uh, so it's a, it's a truly diverse um, population that we serve, uh, and that was given space to breathe and to exercise its voice within our, our setting, uh, which I thought was really fantastic. And we heard a lot of really great feedback from the conference attendees. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a brief recap of what I got out of this anyway. And I do want to say um, one other thing. Uh, we do have a question, but I just wanted to say I am also a tribal citizen of Choctaw Nation, so I participated in the Growing Hope program that Jacqueline um, talked about. And um, it makes me think of something that uh, Melissa Wall shared yesterday about the cultural efficacy, because um, we couldn't figure out why this participation in this program for me and my family was so powerful. Um, we got the seeds and we planted our garden and each, we've done it for a few years and each year we kind of, you know, we get a little bit better at it. And yesterday during that presentation of cultural efficacy, I realized that's what we were experiencing. We, you know, I think we often struggle with um, trying to speak our language, it's hard to learn it, and you can sometimes make mistakes. And, you know, it's easier to not try. And I think that um, when Melissa said cultural efficacy, that's what it is, and maybe that's an entry point, like Tara said in her presentation yesterday. Food is um, generous. Plants and animal relatives give us these gifts, and it is a way to connect with who we are. And so it really did change my life to be part of that program that you started mm -hmm. as a citizen, but also as a, as a study Aww. person. Thank you, Bobby. That's yeah. Love you. It feels really good to have this connection of us together because when I see those pictures of what has happened in Alaska, it feels like it happened to all of us. And it reminds me of Nicole's talk yesterday, like the switch. And I think, um, you know, I think the main message from this is to listen and to share, and maybe that's what public health 
interventions should actually just be. Um, so there is a question about getting grants. <laughs> how do the panelists know or have an idea on how to get a grant for a small farm? We work with both rural and urban indigenous communities, but mostly the latter. They could really use fresh produce. Anybody uh, on the panel, Laverne? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is right. Okay, I I wanted to just say that you know the way that I actually got connected with Valerie was by attending um, a promoting indigenous research leadership program through Montana State, um, and uh, it was uh, they you know NIH was there sharing a little bit about their funding. Um, but there was people all over the room that were doing amazing things, and we, we got, were able to get connected with a mentor and just have really great discussions about our projects and ideas. Uh, but that's where I met Valerie, and we were just saying, Jessica and I were, you know, were talking, and she was, Jessica was sharing with her that um, we have this um, project that we're doing with a clinical translational research uh, project um, grant, and she said this would be an amazing, um, uh, this will really align with what I'm doing with CP. Um, and so I just wanted to put a plug for that program, Promoting Indigenous Research Leadership. Um, and they, um, for the, I think every year, have just take um, uh, applications uh, from people. So that was just one example. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I don't know much about USDA, but I know they have a lot of tribal programs. There's a lot of interest in this. and get some help and mentoring on grant writing. Those grant writing workshops are really good. Um, and then First Nations Development Institute, they have some grants. Um, Tara or other guys, do you know? There's probably, a, there's probably a few and we could maybe, with our contacts, kind of share some grant um, resources. National um, NCAI, they have a resource book on grants that fund um, food sovereignty. So that, that I would recommend. We have a question for Jacqueline. Do you get enthusiastic community involvement with your seed distribution? What strategies have you implemented to increase interest and involvement in gardening and keeping the seeds? Oh, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, we, we have had great interest in this. I think this past year alone, we sent out over 200,000 seeds. And there's some of our tobacco seeds are so tiny, they look like a little tiny seed tip. They look like a speck. So when we measure those out, we give like a quarter of a teaspoon or so forth. So there's really no telling how many seeds we've sent out. But um, yeah, there's a huge enthusiasm. Everybody's really excited about it. Children, we have it from, from um, our toddlers on up. Everybody's getting involved. We want our elders, our children. We want everybody to be involved in this and learn there's a good way to eat. And there's, it's a communal thing. It, it brings back our ancestors, brings back family and community. And then um, what strategies? Uh, well, a lot of, I had just actually germinated a seed. It's from an 1811 dig site, agency dig site for the Choctaw Nation. I've had these seeds. I've been with Choctaw Nation for six years. I've had these seeds for five. And every year I'd plant a few and then just disperse them. And I've given them to professors. I've given them to master gardeners. No one could get these seeds. So when I did, I, I, you know, uh, they actually, I, I was taking a nap one afternoon, and the Lord spoke, and he said, you know, these seeds aren't getting any younger. I'm like, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> so I just went all in. <laughs> so I, I Googled it, and I did, did my research and so forth. When I did, I had four germinate, so now we have some endangered gourds growing. We're very excited about that. So, but yeah, there's, a, in, in our other seeds, we put, thank you, thank you. We're really excited about that. Yeah, the seeds here that we just have a big outpouring, um, and we have uh, we sent out over 100, 176,000 individuals. Wow. And I'll, I'll just share that um, I was talking about the CE initiatives with our community advisory board, and one of them said, "I'm a Choctaw citizen, and I got seeds from the Growing Hope Project in Alaska," uh, and he was extremely excited for it. So. I don't want anybody hungry. I want us to have food for everyone. I don't want anybody discriminated against. We've had that done to us. Let's lead by example. Let's not do lead by what they led us to. Let's, let's lead while we're taught. Thank you so much, everybody on the panel. Great work.